Hey everybody, this is Eric back with you today. We're going to jump into uh, video number three of our oxygenation physiology and transport ventilation lecture. Um, we're going to take a look today at overall minute ventilation and how our minute ventilation can uh, play a role in overall ventilator management. This is a real important concept. So let's kind of jump in. Minute ventilation, we have to remember, is the sum of two parts. And those two parts are our overall tidal volume and our overall respiratory rate. So when we look at tidal volumes, as I've spoke before in video number one, tidal volumes need to be very physiologic. We don't need huge tidal volumes. And those tidal volumes need to be between uh, six to eight mils per kilo for lung protective strategy. And if you remember in video one, I said that we should never really exceed six mils per kilo in a normal patient. There are some instances where we could go higher on our tidal volume, and we'll discuss those in later videos. Um, but for this, we want a good physiologic tidal volume, and six mils per kilo um, takes care of that. So we also need to identify our respiratory rate. So respiratory rate is going to be based on the overall lung protective strategy and the strategy that we actually employ for our ventilator management patients. Are we looking at an injury approach or are we looking at an obstructive approach? And again, we'll look at those two approaches in later videos, so stay tuned for those. So our respiratory rate, again, is gonna be based on the approach, but how do we come up with the set respiratory rate? Well, we have to understand that our minute ventilation needs are real similar, if not identical to our cardiac output needs. And our cardiac output needs are four to eight liters per minute. That's the amount of cardiac output we need to uh, propel oxygen-rich blood, oxygen-rich hemoglobin throughout our body to maintain good homeostasis and to provide good ATP uh, synthesis based on our aerobic metabolism. We also need the same amount of minute ventilation. We need four to eight liters per minute. So we're gonna to try to show you a few different concepts in how to use minute ventilation in a way that is gonna, number one, take care of the dead space that we lose, and also give you an adequate alveolar minute ventilation. So let's take a look at that. Minute ventilation needs. The big thing we have to understand is that minute ventilation needs are a product of um, an intubated patient, right? We're not talking about a patient that is sitting there um, without an ET tube in place. And if you were to look at you and I sitting here right now, our O2 consumption needs are approximately 60 cc's a kilogram a minute. If you were to calculate that out, that would give you a, a range of minute ventilation between that four and eight liters per minute. Well, now we're talking about a patient that's actually intubated. They've got a hyperdynamic state. And what I mean by that is they're in a situation where their consumption is either meeting the delivery or it's far exceeding the delivery. You have to understand that we deliver a huge amount of oxygen each minute. Approximately 1,000 mils a minute is delivered with a normal patient, normal homeostasis, when we have a normal hemoglobin concentration we deliver about a thousand mils a minute, but we only use a very small fraction of that, very tiny fraction of that. So we have a huge amount of reserves. But when we get into a situation that's uh, secondary to an illness, an injury, a sympathetic response, we start utilizing those stores very, very quickly. So based on that, um, we use a formula that's double what our normal consumption or our normal um, need would be, and that's 120 cc's a kilogram a minute. So we utilize this formula, and this is going to be your kind of golden rule formula. If anything that I teach you in these presentations, this is the one thing that's going to really assist you in maintaining, number one, good alveolar minute ventilation, number two, eucapnia, which is a normal, proper CO2 regulation range that we want to kind of meet and it's going to really assist you in maintaining the ventilator on your patients you're going to have less problems you're going to have less alarms and things like that so let's take a look at what we need and, and how all this uh, works the first thing we have to understand is minute ventilation is again the sum of tidal volume and rate but we have to understand what is actually reaching our alveoli our alveolar minute ventilation is what we are utilizing for gas exchange. 
And really that's the most important thing. Our minute ventilation is obviously important, but what are, what are we actually utilizing for gas exchange? So we have to always think about minute ventilation in terms of alveolar minute ventilation. So we have to be able to provide enough alveolar minute ventilation to maintain eucapnia. Again, that's our primary goal is to maintain a good CO2 range. Our PaCO2 needs to be in that normal range because we have to remember that your CO2 is the biggest player in affecting change on your pH. That's what really affects change on your pH is, is that. Dead space is something we see in our ET tube our ventilator circuit, um, our equipment. We lose a lot of volume each breath based on that equipment and those, those equipment issues. We have to calculate this and we can calculate this in two different ways. The first way, and this is, this is utilized in our pediatric population for very small adults, um, children, and things like that. For every pound of ideal body weight, Okay, not kilograms, but body weight, we lose approximately one mil of uh, volume each breath. For an adult patient, a normal size adult patient, you can kind of round that up and you can say that we lose approximately 150 mils per breath in dead space. You have to think about how much are we utilizing or losing per minute. If you have a respiratory rate set at 14, and you multiply it 14 times 150, that's the amount of dead space loss that you're not getting to your alveolar level. So you could understand that this is a very important concept to grasp. So let's look at this from the perspective of this calculation of 120 cc's a kilogram a minute. And again, this is gonna be your gold standard formula to always look at. Obviously with any patient, we have to think about ideal body weight. And I'm not going to go into ideal body weight on this presentation, but just know for this presentation, we're going to say ideal body weight for a five foot 10 male patient is 80 kilos. So we take this formula, we have 120 cc's times the kilograms equals the desired minute ventilation per minute. So if we take 120 times 80, that gives us 9,600 mils, and that's our desired minute ventilation. All right, 9,600 mils is also equal to 9.6 liters per minute. Well, let's take this a step further. Now we have to identify what our tidal volume is. Because remember, we have our desired minute ventilation now. Our desired minute ventilation is 9,600 mils per minute. And if you remember back a few slides, our desired goal for minute ventilation is four to eight liters per minute. And I'll always preach that we want to maintain as close to normal physiology as possible. But to do that, we have to understand that because of the dead space loss, we have to raise that minute ventilation up a little bit. And it'll all make sense here in a second. So our tidal volume is going to be based on our ideal body weight. And again, remember we start at six mils per kilo, so it's simple multiplication. We take 80 times six mils, or six, and that gives you, us a tidal volume of 480. Now we do simple division. We take our desired minute ventilation of 9,600 mils, we're down here at the bottom. We divide that by our tidal volume, because remember, minute ventilation is the sum of two parts. We have our tidal volume times our rate equals our minute ventilation. Well, in this situation, we have our desired minute ventilation, we have our tidal volume, we just don't have our rate. So we do simple division, 9600 divided by 480 equals approximately 18 to 20 breaths per minute. Now, if you're sitting back and you're thinking, man, that's a high respiratory rate. Well, you're right, it is a little bit higher, but you have to think about the new science. The new science is, again, low tidal volumes, lung protective strategy. We still have to meet the minute ventilation goals. We still have to meet what our body needs to maintain eucapnia and homeostasis. So if we're using lower tidal volumes, we have to use a higher rate. What I do in my clinical practice is I always start on every patient 
that's an injury approach. And again, I'm not going to get into the injury and obstructive approach, but I will start with a rate of 18. That gives me a great starting point. I always start at 6 mils per kilo on my tidal volume. And then I titrate my rate based on what I need for overall minute ventilation. So 9,600 mils, divide that by 480 equals 18, we'll say. And so our rate on our ventilator needs to be set at 18. Our tidal volume needs to be set at 480. And that gives us a desired minute ventilation of 9,600 mils or 9.6 liters per minute. Now let's look at this from the perspective of how we used to do this. We used to do this and we just arbitrarily would put 500 mils in the ventilator. We would put a rate of 12. I know if you've been doing this a while, you probably kind of chuckle. That's exactly how I used to approach it. You know, I thought, you know, 500 is a great tidal volume, a rate of 12. My argument was always, if they're innovated, they're sedated well, their pain management is adequate, why do we need a rate higher than that? Well, here's why. If we take this old way and we do the same exact math that we just did on the previous slide, 500 times 12, it gives us a minute ventilation of 6,000 mils or six liters. And if you remember, that's right in the middle of our four to eight liters per minute, and that's great. But let's mo uh, figure out what our dead space loss is. Again, remember our dead space loss for an adult is very simple. We take the respiratory rate that we have set on the ventilator, we multiply that by 150 mils. That's a great number that's, that we just round up. That gives us 1,800 mils or 1.8 liters that we're losing each minute in dead space. So essentially what that means is that even though that's our minute ventilation of 6,000 mils, we are not getting 6,000 mils or six liters to our alveolar level for gas exchange. So we have to figure out what we're actually getting to the alveolar level. And we just take the 6,000 mils or six liters we minus or subtract the loss in dead space of 1.8 liters, and that gives us a, a overall minute ventilation alveolar wise, so our alveolar minute ventilation of 4.2 liters per minute. Now, you can see that we're still in the range of four to eight liters per minute, but we have to consider some things. Number one, we're not talking about a patient that's in normal homeostasis. We're talking about a patient that's in a uh, very sick state, they're in a state of hypoxia probably, whether it's sepsis, they're in a hyperdynamic state where their consumption is far exceeding the delivery. So 4.2 liters per minute is just not going to cut it. For you and I sitting here right now watching this video or presenting this video, 4.2 liters per minute is just fine because again, remember we deliver far more oxygen than we actually consume. If we take the 9.6 liters per minute, the golden formula, right? That's what we just looked at on the previous slide. That was what we got for our desired minute ventilation. We subtract 2.7 liters per minute. The way where I got that from is I took the 18 breaths per minute that we figured out on the previous slide. I multiplied that by 150 and that's my, my overall dead space loss that we would see for a patient utilizing a respiratory rate of 18 breaths per minute. And if we subtract that from the 9.6, we get now a 6.9 liter per minute overall alveolar minute ventilation. This is a great, great minute ventilation. This is in that four to eight liters per minute range, but it's on the high end. And you have to remember again, you're dealing with a hyperdynamic patient. These patients have a huge consumption amount based on their disease process. And we have to meet that. We have to make sure that we're oxygenating their lungs, but obviously they have some type of potential shunt. Um, they could have some dead space ventilation. They could have a lot of issues that's inhibiting good diffusion and um, oxygenation. So we have to make sure we're delivering the proper amount of minimum ventilation that's going to give adequate oxygenation to drive ATP synthesis, aerobic metabolism, and good cellular function. So like I said, utilize the 120 cc's a kilogram a minute. It will be your, the, the go-to formula for 
um, maintaining good eucapnea on every patient. It's a great way to um, deal with your patients. The last thing I want to discuss regarding this is something called exhale tidal volume. And your ventilators have this function where it will look at a second by second accounting of what is coming back out of the ventilator. So how we use this, we use this in a few different ways. You can utilize this and look at how much you're putting in. So if you're putting in 500 on your tidal volume and you're getting out, let's say 430 mils on your exhale tidal volume and that stays pretty consistent, then all things are good. At the very bottom it says should be within plus or minus 50 mils of the set tidal volume. That's kind of just a textbook number. What I can say application wise clinically, if you're consistently staying at 70 plus or minus, then don't worry about it. It's where you start seeing something trend downward or upward that you want to start looking at changing something. The second thing we use this for is looking at lung compliance. And a COPD or asthma patient is a perfect example. If you understand that disease process, those patients have a real difficult time getting the air back out. So they start having a phenomenon called air trapping, and that causes auto peep. The auto peep, the amount of exhaled volume that's remaining in their alveoli continues to build and build and build. Well, eventually, secondary to their respiratory muscle fatigue and the air trapping and the air that's trapped in that chest, their respiratory compliance, the, the, the respiratory chest compliance starts decreasing significantly. And what you'll see with your exhale tidal volume is it'll start trending down. You may start seeing it in the beginning be 400 mils on a 500 tidal volume, but you start seeing it trend down to 360, 340, 320, 280. If you see that phenomenon, and this is a great way to identify a decompensating patient, you need to immediately address that issue. And probably in that situation, the best way to deal with that is just disconnect the ventilator and take the, the vent circuit off the ET tube and let them exhale. Don't bag them, don't do anything else, but just let that air that's trapped in the chest exhale back out because what'll happen is that's gonna start impeding on those vessels you're gonna start causing essentially the same phenomenon as a tension pneumothorax and a cardiac tamponade, and your patient's gonna go into a Brady arrest and die on you. So this is a great tool uh, in regards to chest wall compliance. And then the last reason why we use exhale tidal volume is on pressure control ventilation. When we're delivering a breath based on pressure, volume targeted, pressure dr delivered, we utilize exhale tidal volume to actually identify the tidal volume we're getting based on the pressure. And I don't, I'm not going to go too far into that. We'll discuss pressure control ventilation in depth in later videos. But exhale tidal volume is a great tool that's uh, utilized on ventilators that you can access very, very easily. If you haven't seen my video on exhale tidal volume, check it out. Uh, it's a very quick, short video. It demonstrates how you can utilize exhale tidal volume on pressure control ventilation. I've got the ventilator out, I've got a test lung out, and you can check that out. Just go to the channel and um, you can search for that. So all of these things that I talked about today are important. Continue joining us for these videos. They're gonna be short, they're gonna be very focused, and please leave your comments again that's how we learn we collaborate um, i want to learn from you as well if you have techniques if you've learned different things in your clinical practice please share them with the community and i will talk to you soon